While the link between biological allergens like mold and asthma has been thoroughly studied and well known, comparatively little work has been done in the way of volatile organic compounds. I'll give you a simple example. What is the impact to the air quality within your home when you spray an insect with a pesticide? Exposure to organohalide-based pesticides like, for example, dichlorodiphenyl, trichloroethane, also known as DDT, have been shown to impact the neural behavior of children and can even be passed from expectant mothers to their newborns. Yes, you can be born with air-based pollutants already in your bloodstream. The project that I am proposing would assess the concentration of volatile organic compounds contained in multifamily housing stock around Metro Atlanta. We could then map the data, explore the relationships between indoor air pollutants, respiratory health outcomes, income, and even race. I am currently in the early stages of mapping who actually owns all of the housing across Metro Atlanta. While we can usually look up who owns a given piece of property on the county tax assessor's website, the increasing incursion of corporate owners into the housing market means that these companies are using a variety of strategies to both insulate themselves from legal liability and hide the full extent of their holdings from public view. One way that they do this is by using a variety of shell companies to register their various property holdings under, which then obscures not only who actually owns a given property, but how many other properties that umbrella holding company controls. So with support from a GSU scholarly support grant, I'm currently working with one of my graduate students to disentangle these complex webs of ownership and identify who the biggest owners of housing and other forms of real estate are across the five core counties of Metro Atlanta and which communities are most affected by this concentrated ownership of housing. As perimeter college faculty, I don't have an active research lab, but I do work with students in my introductory biology course to help measure the work our campus trees are doing to remove carbon from the air. A year ago, my class tagged and measured about 60 trees on campus, and this year's class remeasured them, allowing us to calculate how much carbon those trees pulled out of the atmosphere over the course of the year. In this project, the students see firsthand the importance of bigger, older trees, as their large trunks and many branches can help add carbon at higher rates than younger, smaller trees. They also calculate just how many trees would be needed to completely offset the carbon emissions of an average college student. It's a lot. And become more mindful of their impacts on the environment. As we continue to monitor and add trees to our survey, we can also look at the differences in garbage storage among different tree species and differences between forest trees and those in more open campus areas. I'm hoping to get other campuses involved with similar monitoring projects as well. A specific project related to this wicked problem is called the Ecological Equity Audit. These are research portfolios that our students compile by critically examining their student teaching placement. Audits analyze the socio-historical, economic, racial, and political conditions impacting their schools and their students' development. By including audits in teacher preparation, we're attempting to shift away from a traditional emphasis in teacher preparation on just students' instructional skills and towards their contexts and environments. The audit supports our equity-oriented teachers to deepen their critical consciousness and awareness of often oppressive social conditions impacting their students. We analyze what Gro and Pena originally called the hidden curriculum. This is the unstated norms, values, and beliefs that are transmitted to students through the underlying structure of meaning in both formal content as well as the social relations of their school, classroom, and community life. Audits contain methodical prompts to help educators uncover specific elements of the hidden curriculum in their schools, including oppressive school, classroom, housing, and community conditions. But this project also helps to educators see how to counter these conditions. For example, audits reveal possible points of resistance to economic and racial stratification by compelling our students to create community asset maps. 
These maps show a very wide range of community institutions, outreach centers, community members, and community leaders who our teachers could partner with to enhance their standardized curricula by what we call contextualizing their content to the lived experiences of their students. Audits from previous years were shared with GSU's College of Law professor Tanya Washington's year two law students who then took our findings to craft legal and policy briefs for local school districts. Uh, I'm working on several housing, uh, housing related projects. Um, there's projects on courts and housing and the role and process of eviction courts. Uh, this plays out in the fact that in Georgia, there are 159 counties and there's a prevailing joke that there are 159 different ways of dealing with housing eviction. And that's because while there is one law in the state of Georgia that governs questions of housing and eviction, that law is vague in terms of the exact policies and practices that need to be put in place. And while in um, many types of court cases, MERS is an example, uh, you know, there have been lots of precedent of laws, that doesn't happen in, in, in civil law, in housing law. And so there's a lot of gray area in this process. And what that means is that courts interpret that policy and that practice very differently. And that can play out in terms of the form that you're, being, you're using to respond to a summons. It can mean that the summons can be somewhat different itself. Who is bringing that summons to a renter or uh, who is performing the eviction is different. Sometimes that can be a sheriff's officer, sometimes that can be a constable. And why that matters is that a sheriff's officer is a sheriff. They're their own separate law enforcement agency. They may work with the court, but they do not actually respond or serve the court in that sense. Whereas a constable works directly for the court. If there is an issue with a case, if there is a question that comes up, they can will take that directly to the chief magistrate of the court because that's who they work for. And those questions of governance and how this plays out have huge impacts on the variation of what it means. And what it means in that particular context is that what's happening in a court in one county can be very different than what happens to you in an eviction case in a court in another county, even if they're only a couple miles apart. Uh, other projects that we've taken on in this way uh, is uh, in Clayton County, uh, we have what's called the Homeless Intervention Prevention Program, and that's working with local government, magistrate court, and local nonprofits, seeking to create interventions in housing insecurity and related issues. So we work directly with government and non-governmental agencies to understand and reduce housing security in the area. This all involves understanding the relationship between housing insecurity, transportation, education, health, and food. Uh, we have another project we've recently begun in Rockdale County that's trying to address the issue of housing and poverty uh, with local nonprofits there as well. Uh, there as well. And these all relate to issues that the, these um, counties are, are in the path of what we call the suburbanization of poverty. They have long-standing historical issues of housing insecurity and poverty themselves that's now being compounded by the gentrification in Atlanta that is pushing people out of Atlanta and into these farther and farther suburban spaces that creates new uh, pressures and processes in these ways. And so these things play out in what we call the suburbanization of poverty.